Okay, we have a few housekeeping uh, rules. Uh, we ask everyone to please refrain from applause or comments during the interview process. Uh, also, we ask that you do not record the interview uh, tonight, uh, we record it as they're going on. And uh, we want to thank everyone for coming out tonight to uh, our second night of interviews. At this time, we'll turn it over to Dr. Bush. You have five minutes to introduce yourself before we begin our questions. Hello, everyone. Good evening. I am Angela Bush, and I'm I'm originally from Anson, Alabama. I currently reside in the Clay Trustful area of Birmingham. I uh, began education as a high school English teacher and I taught for nine years. After that, I was given the opportunity to serve the school district in a capacity at the central office. So I served as a student um, services specialist for a little over 10 years in that capacity. I um, was given opportunities to work with all of our average students in our school district to um, serve as a liaison between Jefferson County Schools and Birmingham Family Court. I worked with um, law enforcement, court officials, city officials. Um, I conducted class three hearings for my major disciplinary infractions to determine if students were going to be expelled or not. I also served as the truancy officer for Jefferson County Schools. Also at the central office um, level, I served as a um, federal program specialist. I work with um, the Title I schools, and I provide assistance to Title I principals in the areas of um, developing and following a continuous improvement plan with um, creating a budget and maintaining the budget throughout the school year, assisting in um, hiring credential employees. Also, I served as a school district McKinney Intel Race liaison as well. I did that for approximately three years. I am um, probably into my maybe ten and a half years. I was actually conducting a class three hearing when our superintendent came in and asked me if I would go um, to an elementary school as an interim principal. And it was in August, and he asked me if I would go for the entire school year. Of course, I said yes. I enjoyed it. I fell in love with being back in the school. So here I am seven years later I'm as a school administrator. I'm an administrator of Urban Middle School. Urban is located in Central Point, Alabama. Um, I have one son. My son is a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy and he's a Naval Officer in San Diego, California. And I just want to thank you all for the opportunity for this interview. I mean, five minutes. Hey, Dr. Bush, I will start our uh, question for tonight. Just let you know that we'll be taking notes, so we're listening. But uh, we'll be taking notes so that we can uh, you know, make make uh, proper notes for our, our, our recommendation, our references. Yes, sir. Uh, superintendent Board Relationships. What are the methods you will use to keep yourself and the board current on important matters? First of all, I completely understand and I have a healthy knowledge that as a superintendent, I would work for the board. So I would make sure that I'm in complete contact with board members on a daily and weekly basis. That's in order um, for us to get to know each other, to build trust, and to sustain trust. Also, I, I would like to meet with the board members too, so you all can establish some expectations of how we would like you to communicate with you all. I would definitely want to know the best methods of communicating with you all. I'm in that uh, meeting, I would just, of course, discuss in, in emergency times, how would you all like me to contact with you? I, I want to make sure that I'm communicating with you all to meet your needs and the needs of the school district as well. Also, um, as a superintendent, just, just as a person, I love learning. So, going into a role as a superintendent, I welcome professional development. I welcome mentoring, I mean, mentorships. I would ensure that I am affiliated with every state superintendent association so that I can remain um, and stay abreast of current issues. I would also uh, make it a to be intentional in forging relationships with superintendents and surrounding
surrounding areas, the superintendents of this particular region. And as a superintendent, I, I would definitely bring that information back to the board and turn it around. And, and I also enjoy just moving beyond the state and looking at nationally and joining superintendent um, associations nationally just so that I can remain current and relevant and communicate that information to you all as well. And 
there was proven data to show that it was aligned with those state assessments. Dr. Bush, what is the role of the superintendent in stimulating the faculty towards professional growth and self-improvement? Outline the types of programs you feel will provide adequate professional growth and development for the staff. It's my professional opinion and my personal opinion that the superintendent is responsible for creating a culture throughout the entire school district where PD is embedded in what you do on a day-to-day -day basis so that no one is surprised. It is not an extra task. It's a way of doing business for a school district. Professional growth and self-improvement, they go hand-in-hand. Hand. I believe as a school district, and especially where we are right now in our climate, considering we are in a COVID area, hopefully we're moving out of this COVID area, but we've seen a significant number or increase in mental health issues. We want to make sure that our teachers are social and emotionally whole, because if you're not emotionally whole, you can never teach a child. You're not going to be successful. So as a school district, I think it's very important that there are components where we are meeting those self-improvement needs for the teacher. Um, and examples would be um, social and emotional training and just ensuring that our district has a solid employee assistance program. Also, um, just looking in terms of just making sure we keep the students first, ensuring that the teachers are provided quality people. And when I'm speaking of PD, I'm thinking of, again, something that's embedded in the culture, something that we're doing on a quarterly basis, think in terms of incorporating, if you don't already have those e-learning days, where the teachers have one day per nine weeks where they are receiving district-level professional development. They're receiving that social and emotional uh, training on those particular days. Also, I'm uh, just thinking in terms of professional development and how we look at the school level, implemented from the district level, I, I, I wholeheartedly believe in POCs, professional learning communities. Professional learning communities have been um, very significant in moving my current school forward. Professional learning communities, where we are now, we have those once a week. It's not a surprise to anyone, everyone expects it. We allow our classroom data to determine what we are going to discuss in those um, PDs on a weekly basis, the teacher expects it, it's a part of our culture. We, uh, we, we talk to our teachers about that and, and, and they all agree that they wanted to professionally develop. However, time was important, time was a concern for them. So we were very strategic in our master scheduling to ensure that we can incorporate time throughout the school day for those teachers to plan and collaborate. So with our POCs, we meet on a weekly basis, we meet every Tuesday. We um, as the instructional leader of the building, I go around, I have my instructional rounds, I look in the classroom, the instructional coaches go as well, and we look at um, areas where, of, of improvement. And we provide immediate feedback. The immediate feedback to the teachers where it's we on a weekly basis. We create a Google Doc. Very, very, very simple, maybe about three to four questions, go into the classroom, do a quick observation, and provide the teacher with that immediate uh, feedback. So that when I leave the classrooms, teachers understand like the areas uh, where the wows and the wonders were. Um, also, we also, we also have uh, incorporated a plus day. That's another uh, way for professional development to be implemented from the district level, but again, it's embedded in the day-to-day -day operations of the school. And with the plus day, it allows the teachers to plan in 21-day cycles. And with the 21-day cycles, each content area has one Wednesday, her want to actually plan, and so this is the day that they're not in the classroom, they're all together, they're collaborating and planning. It gives them an opportunity to do their planning throughout the school day, you're talking to other teachers, you're getting best practices and the best, best ideas. And that's something that could be implemented from the district level, and again, that's what we're doing from 745 until 315, and teachers appreciate that because when they leave school, all they have to do at that point is pretty much tweak what they're working on for the next day and for the next week. Given your research of Selma City Schools, what innovative strategies and approaches will you employ to increase student achievement 
quality of education, facilities, effective use of funding. What does this plan look like? And what will it what will be the proposed outcomes for several city schools? Okay, um, first of all, implementing a comprehensive needs analysis where we're looking at all those areas. We're looking at student achievement, the quality of education facilities, and effective use of funding. That will be a part of the 30, 60, 90 day entry plan. And of course, that's something that requires a team collectively to work with. And looking at that needs assessment, we will utilize that data to look at the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats, whether they are internal or external. And using the information, the data that's gathered from that um, SWOT analysis, we would look at proposed outcomes and establish the SMART goals ensure that those goals are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and executed in a timely fashion. For um, increasing student achievement, I think the most important thing is recruiting and retaining high quality employees. In fact, that goes across the board. It covers all sections, student achievement, quality of education facilities, and funding. It's just very important that we make sure that we have high quality people in position. More specifically for um, enhancing instruction and quality of education, going back to that program instructional analysis, giving a, a complete analysis of the current instructional programs to see what's in place, what's working, what type of professional development is offered to teachers, support, and looking at incentive piece for students and for teachers. Looking at um, the facilities part, facilities is very important, and especially where we are right now in our climate, considering school safety, that's a huge part of um, facilities. I've served on our district's um, collaborative team where we designed a school safety plan for our entire school district. We created a model for that. Also on the facility side, is going to be very important and a priority to ensure that all the facilities are equitable. And I'm speaking when I say equitable, I mean inside and outside of the facilities. Also, uh, with, with funding, most important thing, as a school district, we want to make sure that we are physically responsible in our spending. Number one, ensure that we always have at least a one month reserve, operating reserve, and to ensure that all the spending in the district is driven by the data. I think I answered both of those. Okay. okay, the next question is going to piggyback on that question. Given your research of Selma City Schools, what are the top three priorities to produce measurable outcomes in student achievement, quality of education, facilities, and effective use of funding? Talk about your past experiences and successes. We're looking for the top three priorities. Okay, so um, three priorities and looking at those areas. I think the first thing would be um, to look at the current strategic plan. In my research, I saw that um, it was created from 2018 to 2023. So I, I see that uh, Selma City Schools are approaching, updating that strategic plan. But looking at those areas, in, in terms of student achievement, again, recruiting and retaining high quality employees throughout the entire school district, that is going to enhance student achievement, the quality of education, and it helps assist with facilities management as well. My experience in this area, I, um, I have served on our central office recruiting team for a number of years. Um, we have a where we are very specific in um, a hiring. When we're looking in terms of hiring, we're looking for the best fit for that particular school and for the school district. I know we're in an era where there are teacher shortages, but I'm just of the belief that you want to make sure you have the best fit and not just a warm body for that particular school. I have also served in capacity as a mentor principal where I've, I've led workshops on hiring practices throughout our school district. Um, as a central office employee, um, again, as I mentioned, I travel to different universities intentionally recruiting the employees that were needed for specific schools. 
a, a, a personal story for me, and, and because I believe that recruiting the right people is so important in our approach to recruiting. A personal story for me, I graduated from Alabama in 1995. I went to my first job fair, and Jersey County Schools were there. They recruited me. I wanted to go to Atlanta, so I really wasn't thinking about Jersey County Schools. My focus was on Atlanta. But then after a couple of months, and I was moving towards graduation, and my mom was putting pressure on me about paying my own bills, I went back to the job fair. And when I went back to the job fair, at that time, I was looking for Jefferson County Schools, and I was looking for them because when I met them two months earlier, they were very personal. They were very intentional. They spoke with me, and they let me know that there was a need for my presence in the school district that the students needed me. So when I went back to that job fair, I was looking for so just recruiting is very important, important and just being intentional so that whoever you're recruiting, they understand the why and the why of the school district. For our facility management, a priority, school safety, and just ensure that all facilities are equitable throughout the school district. I, I have experience in this area. I, again, like I mentioned, I served in our district committee in this area. And I also was given an opportunity to manage a $17 million renovation project at Earth Middle School. We I went through that project during the 1920 school year during COVID, the onset of COVID. And with that uh, management of the, of the school, we our school was completely renovated. We had buildings torn down and everything while we were conducting school during that time. Um, I, I'm a very astute um, person on learning, so I'm always going to keep myself abreast of what's going on with the current safety issues for facility management as well. I, I served as, again, I mentioned a federal program specialist, so I, I understand the importance for spending and appropriate use of funding. I also served on our federal program's budget advisory committee.
hear from all the stakeholders, including the teachers, the students, and the community, to hear what their concerns are. In turn, I would also want to be very transparent with all the stakeholders and let them know exactly where we are as a school district. When I'm thinking in terms of someone wanting to motivate me or I want to motivate someone, I have to have a conversation with you to understand what drives you. And then in being transparent in those listening tours, presenting that low-hanging fruit so we can come to some type of common agreement of, of things that the teachers can actually work towards. Um, at my um, current school, we had this issue. I mean, everybody knows going through the COVID area, that era, that's when we really started experiencing this significant teacher shortage. Teacher attendance was a huge issue. Student attendance was a huge issue. And just getting people involved, we had to think of a different way to do school and how we would bring people into our building. So with this, I, I met with our teachers. Hey, this is where we are. This is what's going on. We need you in school. Of course, we want you to remain safe, but we need you in the building. What are some things that I can do for you as your instructional leader to motivate you to come to school every day? And they mentioned they needed something as simple as something to look forward to. So because they told me what they needed, it was my job as their instructional leader to make sure that I went out and got it. And of course in the school, you know, we have local funds, state funds, and federal funds. State and federal funds, that's for instructional purposes only. Providing incentives for teachers, that require me to move beyond the four walls of the school to get involved with the community. So with that being said, I, I, I took a couple of days and I just drove around the community of Center Point and meeting with the local churches, trying to meet with different businesses that were in that era, area and letting them know where we were, what the concerns were. And they were all willing to help. And their, their first thing was, of course we don't mind helping, but we don't know what's going on in the school. We don't know what you all are facing. So what I learned from that is that you know people will help, but you have to get out and get into the community so they'll know what's going on. So with those our partnerships that we formed, I was able to secure, we have three $50 gift cards that we give away every single month to teachers with perfect attendance. Um, we also offer um, two catered meals per month for our teachers, and that's something for them to look forward to. And again, that's nothing that we use money for it. That's something that the community provides for our school and they provide that because they understand the need and they understand where we are, where we are going. So just it's, it's just very important to make the schools very attractive um, to the community so that everybody knows what's going on in the schools. Just being transparent, just being involved in the community. That's been a huge part of the success that I've experienced and at all three of my places at schools, just getting into the community. Next, we'll move into the student affairs section. Um, my question is, uh, what is the role of extracurricular activities other than athletics in the educational program, and how do you feel about no pass, no participate? Okay, I've over research over 100 years or beyond has proven that extracurricular are beneficial to students in more ways than one. I love extracurricular activities because it extends that teaching and learning beyond the four walls of the classroom. It gives the students uh, an opportunity to expand what they're doing. It gives them exposure to, to different things. But also with uh, extracurricular activities, I'm a fan of those because they are the front porch, the side porch, and the back porch into our schools and our school district. That gives the public an opportunity to see what we have going on. It gives them insight if, we, if we're inviting them into our schools and they see exactly what we have going on. With our extracurriculars, I think to have a well-rounded school district, it's very important that the same rules that we apply to our, for our athletes, we apply them across the board. Our high school implemented a, a no pass, no participate, and our middle school adopted it and we tweaked it to meet our needs. But with that, we look at it as an opportunity to provide that extra layer of accountability and support for our students. What, what we currently do is that any student that participates in an extracurricular activity, they have to produce a progress report. 
a weekly progress report, and they produce that to their, their coach or their sponsor, and it has the student's name on it, the sign on it, and the parent signature on it. So that keeps everybody abreast of what's going on with the student on a weekly basis, so we're not waiting until the end of the nine weeks and saying, you can't participate in this golf ball activity, you can't just participate in science Olympiad, because everybody knows what's going on on a weekly basis. With that, we make sure that supports are in place. Those coaches and those sponsors of those extracurricular activities, they provide study hall. This past year, our district provided extended day opportunities for everybody in the school district. So the sponsors and the coaches make sure that their um, athletes or competitors, they were active in those study halls. They received peer tutoring, they received tutoring from teachers, and that helped us academically just across the board. With those progress reports, it included attendance, grades, and their discipline. And again, we look at it as just an extra layer of support for the students and the families. Dr. Bush, describe your ability to cultivate a disciplined, safe, and ordered school environment for students. Okay, um, I, as I mentioned, I was a student services supervisor at the central office for over 10 years, and this is where I particularly work with um, at-risk students, um, work with family court, city government officials, law enforcement, family agencies outside the school district, and moving into a school, a school, a low performance school that was in school improvement, and they had a lot of discipline issues three years ago. I pulled from those experiences. The first thing, we made sure that we had a, a strong leadership team in place. And when I speak in terms of leadership team, I'm speaking in terms of representation throughout the entire building, not just a group of teachers who are always working, but representation throughout the entire building because we need buy-in from everybody. And just thinking in terms of cultivating a discipline and safe and orderly school environment, getting those students involved. Because they're the ones that we, we are wanting to meet our expectations, so we need to hear from them as well and getting our community stakeholders involved. Um, in year one of my school, um, three years ago, starting at early middle school, I, I met with all the teachers, all the students at the different grade levels, and exp explained expectations. And one of the students said, okay, you all have all these expectations of us, but can I have a meet with you? What, what are we going to get out of this? What, what are some fun things that we can do? And I appreciated that, and I welcomed that conversation with that student. And their concern was they, they wanted pep rallies. Um, before I arrived, the school was dismissing, well not dismissing, they were transitioning classes, not by a bell, but by the administrator's announcement over the intercom because there were a lot of altercations in the hallways during class transition. So, I'm just doing my research and collaborating with other principals, we put a lot of operational structures in place to ensure that we, the expectation was we were going to transition from class to class with the bell. We ensure that all of our students, we put a procedure in place that everybody walks to the right of the hallway. Regardless, you walk to the right. If you're a class and you leave one class, if it's right across the hall from the other, you are not permitted to walk across the hallway because we saw the discipline show that those altercations were happening in the hallway. So we just keep a steady flow of the traffic. All teachers are in the middle of the hallway um, during class transition. And it, it, that's been very beneficial in us reducing our disciplinary infractions. We also have uh, put in place a positive basic incentive support system. And, and I think it's very important that we, we, we have expectations and we have rules and guidelines, but we have to have things to motivate students as well. And I'm a firm believer that whatever you're focusing on, that's what you're going to get. So we have to, to move our focus to accentuate that positive, those positive behaviors. We offer an incentive for our students. We have a, we implemented a program that's called SOAR. We recognize our students on a daily basis just for being caught for doing something good in the hallway. With all these things being put in place, we have been able to decrease our disciplinary infractions over three, three years by 42%. We have been able to increase our student attendance to 95%. Of course, that's the minimum goal by the state. We've been able to increase our level of community and criminal support by 900% because we've been really active in our communities. And we've been able to increase our local school budget just through community outreach by uh, 600%. And I do want to say this, that I, I'm happy to have been there for three years because Irwin Middle School has been in existence 
on its own since 2009. There are 15 middle schools in Jefferson County. Every year up until this school year, Irwin Middle School is always ranked as number 14 or 15 school. They were at the bottom. This year, U.S. News, an outside entity, ranked Irwin Middle School as a number five school in our school district. And that's because of all the processes and procedures that we put in place to ensure that our students were safe and instruction was incurred on a day-to-day -day basis. What steps would you take to increase student enrollment and decrease student loss? Give examples of times you have been successful in a similar effort and what were the outcomes? To increase student enrollment, systemic structures have to be put in place. Number one, as I mentioned earlier, we have to do things to make sure that the school district is attractive. I'm sure there are great things that are happening within a school district, but if people don't know what's going on, then they think that nothing is happening in the school district. Retaining more teachers, providing that side-by-side -side coaching for teachers, because to increase the student enrollment, our community has to see that we value education, we have high-quality education, and our students are achieving at a high level. The next thing is just ensure that our facilities are equitable and funding and spending is equitable throughout the entire school district. As a student service supervisor, again, you know, I serve primarily you know, in at-risk schools uh, and at-risk students. And um, at the onset of the pandemic, we, we were hit like everybody else was. We were concerned about student enrollment and student attendance. We had a lot of students that we had not seen. So we knew we had to do some things differently. So we put a process in place last year. We've been successful with it, so we continue to implement that process this year. And that's where we, are, our teachers have a Google Doc on a weekly basis. They update it, and we're looking for students. Any student that has two or more absences for the week, the teacher alerts um, us on a Google Doc. We have a counselor that specifically goes out to the homes. He calls the parents, and he makes the contacts. We work closely with our sheriff department. They are our school resource officers. So they accompany the counselor to those homes. We implemented this process during uh, the onset of the pandemic, we were able to get a lot of our students back in school. What we found out is that a lot of our parents, they were just unsure, uncertain of what was going on in the schools and how we were going to ensure that their students were safe. And for the parents that we saw a lot of resistance, and it was just simply because they did not know what to do. So in providing those home visits, we made sure that our counselor and our school resource officer, and I went out, our assistant principal went out, we help them to navigate through those educational platforms. So by the third nine weeks of last school year, we had every student back in the building with an exception of three. And by the beginning of the fourth nine weeks, we had every student back in the building. And that was just that collective team effort of just moving beyond the four walls of the school and going out into the community, just meeting the parents where they were. We even went to one parent's job. We met her on a job for two weeks, just helping her navigate through those educational platforms.
principals are charged with the responsibility of being um, responsible for local, state, and federal budgets. As a school district, um, systemic structures will be put in place to ensure that all principals are trained on an annual basis. Regardless of how many years you've been a principal, you still need that annual change because things change, guidelines change. When your school districts receive additional funding, there's additional guidelines for those fundings. Um, it's the school's, the school's principal responsibility to have um, a close, ongoing uh, working relationship with the school's bookkeeper to ensure that the school remains fiscally responsible. And just in, thinking in terms of that state and federal budget, of course those are governed by guidelines and based on that per pupil enrollment. When, I, when I'm thinking in terms of the principal as well, the principal is responsible, just like the superintendent, for securing additional funding for the schools. And that's thinking in terms of that local funding. You have to move beyond the four walls of your school. Um, if you're serving a Title I school, you're, you're not going to be able to, to, to charge fees for everything. So you're not going to bring in those extra, that extra funding for your local account so that you can uh, operate and level the playing field for the students. So the principal has to move beyond the four walls of the school and to get into the community to generate that, uh, that support. For faculty members, we'll make sure that faculty members are involved by ensuring that there's a budget committee at every school, a functioning and active budget committee. You want to make sure that your budget committee, um, they are approving every expenditure from the school and the school district.
Dr. Bush, based on what you know about this community and school district, what challenges do you believe our district face right now? Okay. Um, based on what I know about the community, I know that the um, city is extremely rich in history. However, the population is declining. The school districts play a very vital role in restoring STEM back to its pinnacle in America's history. That's going to take a collaborative effort with the city. The school's role is to just ensure that the schools are attractive. Hiring those high quality teachers, being intentional in hiring those teachers and implementing retention focus from a school district level to retain those teachers and focusing on student achievement increasing student achievement. Um, and looking at several schools, I see that you have um, two um, that are ATSI schools and one is the school of improvement. Just ensure that we are doing everything that we, could, we can as far as implementing the best instructional pro programs and practices for our schools so that we have moved every school off the failing school list and there are absolutely no schools on the school improvement list for self. And, and again, I'm just partnering with that community, addressing community issues. That, that's very important because what happens in the community manifests itself in the schools. And in order to be proactive in preventing those things from happening, we have to be connected to the community. We have to actually know what's going on. I'm just thinking in terms of fights, conflicts that are going on in the neighborhood, gang activity. That's our connection to the community. That's our opportunity what's going on so we could be proactive. Dr. Bush, we're going to talk about vision and philosophy. How can seven city schools become more cohesive and systemic with regards to educational practices? Again, going back to that comprehensive needs assessment, just ensure that we know the needs of the school district, establishing district-wide structures, both operational and instructional, and putting practices and procedures in place regarding high-value student outcomes. For example, a systemic practice for grade parameters, for promotion guidelines, looking at the Alabama Literacy, uh, Literacy Act, guidelines for that that are implemented throughout the entire school district. Looking at standards for promoting students, the grading procedures. Are we issuing letter grades? Are we doing standards based? But we, we need to have a criteria that's put in place from the school district's level to determine those things. <coughs> Even looking at the frequency of administering assessments. When you look at those district common assessments, the ACAP, ACT, and those quarterly bench, uh, benchmark assessments, have a frequency that everybody in the school district knows this is how we're operating. Again, being cohesive, looking at doing a complete program analysis and determining which programs are the best fit for this particular school district and ensure that we offer district-wide PD and support for every teacher, again, that is embedded in the way that we do business in the school district. Okay, Dr. Bush, you're on the home stretch. Okay, okay, eliminating the achievement gap is a must. What approach, approaches would you take to pursue this? What leadership and guidance would you provide to ensure that the approaches are properly evaluated and adjusted over time to meet the needs of our students? In my professional and my personal opinion, the most critical component to composing Closing that academic achievement gap is implementing the RTI process to fidelity response to instruction. And of course, you know, it's a tiered approach to early identification and support for our students. Gone are the days where we provide a 45 to a 50 minute lecture to the students and expect them to get. This forces teachers to look at your method or your delivery of instruction and to look at the content of what you're teaching. 
we want to ensure that all of our students are engaged. We want to ensure that the instruction is relevant. If it's not relevant, you're not going to hold the attention of the teachers. With the RTI process, with response to instruction, looking at that multi-tier support, it's important because the teacher needs to have 80% or more persons that are following him or that's following him, that are, that's comprehending. That forces the teacher to do assessments throughout your lesson. Your assessments are ongoing. Once you stop and see, conduct those forms of assessments and see who's not with you, at that point, as the teacher, it's your responsibility to go back and tweak what you're doing. That can include reteaching the lesson. If you have more than 80%, excuse me, uh, less than 80% of your students that are with you. Reteaching the lesson. Pulling and having those small groups, having those one -on, that, that one on one time with the student to ensure that they are understanding the instruction. Now, when you start looking at uh, teachers, when you have more than 5% of your students that are in tier three, that's when you gotta go back to the drawing board. Again, our goal as educators is to make sure that we are providing the avenue for our students to learn and to be engaged. And we're no longer in the days where we just deliver instruction through lectures and expect the students to get it. We have to make sure that we're following this, this multi-tiered approach. And in looking at this multi-tiered approach, I, I like it because when the teachers are planning and the principal as an instructional leader, it, it forces you to look at questions, the, the four important data questions, which are, what do you expect your students to learn? How do you know they've learned it? How do you respond when they don't learn it? And how do you respond when they already know it? And again, that goes back to adding that intervention for the students who are below grade level and that acceleration for our students who are above grade level. The RTI process um, at our school, I'm, I'm at a middle school right now, we implemented it at a, a elementary school, and it can look a little different at each level. So from a systems perspective, develop processes and procedures that teachers can implement it on a monthly basis at the elementary level, the middle school level, and the high school level. And I think when that's implemented to fidelity, you will see an increase in student achievement and the quality of education. Dr. Bush, uh, a couple of closing questions for you. Uh, what do you think has been your most outstanding contribution to your present or most recent school system? I think what's been the, the best contribution is establishing a culture where we value people, we value each other, we value the students and the community. Our, we're, we're, we're a family, and we are all involved in the community. So just cultivating that environment so that everybody understands that every success story is built upon some type of relationship. And then just embedding that relationship into the day-to-day -day workings or operations of your school district. Were there any questions uh, you'd like to ask of us? We've, we've thrown a bunch of questions at you. Now it's your turn. Are there any questions that you'd like to ask of us? I have just one question. What is your, as a board, what, what is your vision for Selma City Schools? Or where would you like to see Selma City move in the next three or five years? For Selma City Schools, I would like to see more focus on the children because we kind of Lots of folks a little bit and doing a lot of extra stuff, you know. And our focus needs to go back to the because we're in a, a, a high poverty area and we, we do our children a disservice if we let them walk across that stage and they not knowing how to read, not knowing how to do math, you know, appropriately. So I want us to come back to focusing on children. I got good education from Selma City School System. And my own children got a good education. All of my siblings got a good education. And I want, I want these, these parents that uh, have children in the system now to say the same thing.
their children got a good education itself. It's family. Yeah, well, we we all uh we're the self citizens, uh we, we all want the best for our children itself and uh we want to thank you for for choosing us and congratulations on being a finalist and uh we have one more candidate to, candidate to interview tonight and uh we really want to thank you for giving us this opportunity to opportunity for interview we really appreciate it thank you all for the opportunity it's my pleasure to be